totally negative. <laughs> Some of the self-deprecating stuff is okay, but yeah, you don't like it too negative. So, but yeah, so let's talk about space. We've got a lot of articles about space. I say a lot. We have three articles about space this week. Mm-hmm. I love space. Yeah, and uh, you know, I was kind of reading through all three of them and kind of slowly begin. I, the more you send, the more of these you send, the more I kind of begin to understand how we actually look out into space and study things. And majority of it is just looking at the electromagnetic spectrum and looking for different phenomena that occurs inside of that. And I guess they base that off of different equations and things like that from what they expect to see. So where do you want to start? Um, black matter destroying itself in the belly of exoplanets. Sounds like what you were getting at. I thought this was interesting because... I think all three of them, like the, the way they observed all this, you know, what I'm talking about applies to all three of them. But yes, yeah, so large gaseous exoplanets could be filled with self-destructing dark matter. So they have a team of researchers that want to propose that the new James Webb Space Telescope that's to be launched uh, should scan distant behemoths in the galaxy for potential heating effects that could arise from dark matter, which outweighs regular matter by almost six to one in the universe. Yeah, so, that blew my mind, that dark matter yeah. outweighs regular, which would make sense because the Newtonian physics or whatever say that the more mass something has, the more gravity, gravitational pull it has. Right, and that's how we know it exists because dark matter tugs gravitationally on stars and galaxies. Dark matter but, uh, is gravity in a sense. So it makes sense so. that if gravity had some kind of manifestation in the real world in the form of dark matter, it would be heavy as fuck. Six to one. Is dark matter defined as gravity? No, I'm making that connection because dark matter perfectly coincides with gravity. That's like why they know it exists because if gravity tugs at everything so if it's black dark matter tugging at it then it's like it's it seems synonymous yeah i get where you're coming from with that just seems to not like what dark matter causes gravity maybe or is it, it just is gravity like what if they they're like, oh, well, it just seems like that's what they would I believe discover. what they think is that it causes gravity almost in the same way that regular matter causes gravity. But it's invisible to us. And it's, right. that's why it's hard for us to understand it's all of its properties. Because the Earth causes gravity, but it, it's not gravity. Right. So I wonder if the Earth is exactly. manipulating dark matter and the dark matter is the actual gravity. Well, I think it, based on logic of this article, if dark matter tugs on stars and galaxies, I'm sure dark matter has some type of gravitational pull on Earth as well. And vice because versa. It's tugging on Earth. And it, because also, it, like that, you know, there's uh, you know, there's also six to one of dark matter compared to regular matter existing in the universe. We just can't observe it and we struggle to understand all of its properties. Interesting. So they, they think that, it, and they think that the dark matter is made up of like individual particles, much yeah. like regular matter, matter is, right? Yeah. So electrons, protons, gluons, quarks, all that shit. Yeah. But, so ba- but in the dark matter form. And so, the, so that the so in that sense, these particles hit one another just the same way regular matter particles hit one another. They assume, and then when they smash together, they annihilate each other and generate heat. So, if that assumption is true, then the dark matter particles should occasionally crash into exoplanets, which cause the particles to lose energy and then accumulate inside those worlds. 
Yeah, they like to. Whenever they annihilate each other, they produce a measurable heat signal that's visible from far away. Now, yeah. So the way I think they did it, because it's like, well, isn't it super hard to measure heat like that? Like see heat variations on a planet like or couldn't you just observe that on Earth if if dark matter exists everywhere? But from what I gather from this article is the way they did this is they looked at super duper old large exoplanets that were like equivalents of super big Jupiters that uh, uh, that were gas cold. Giants. Yeah. If that, you want to know more about cool Jack, very, go ahead. gas giants on one of our recent episodes, we talked about uh, gas giants and sideways rain, <laughs> Jupiter and Titan. And we went into some stuff if you want to know more about. Yeah, those are, some, those are some extreme exoplanets. Oh, yeah, and uh, brown dwarfs. There was a brown dwarf in my toilet this morning. I had to flush it down. Hmm. It was super gaseous. Funny poop humor. There you go. But uh, they looked at these planets that were like basically super old and cooling, and that's how they're able to see this the changes in heat signal. Or that's how they think they will be able to see the changes in heat signals. Yeah. To detect dark matter. And that makes a lot of sense that you would want to isolate the heat and the gamma ray explosion to just itself so it doesn't get convoluted in the heat of a active system. So they, they look out for these old dead stars and then didn't they find some stuff? Or am I thinking of the other article? Mm. I thought they found... Hmm... No, maybe not. The maybe, Nancy was, Grace. I think you're thinking of a different. I think you're thinking of a different article about antimatter. Yeah, anti stars. Right. Yeah. Right. That's the next. We're talking. We're going to talk about that here shortly. So the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope is going to be launched in the mid 2020s, and it'll map the entire sky in exquisite detail. Findings can be expected in the next four to five years. So. Man, the the cosmic microwave background keeps coming up for me. And I just feel like we need to talk about that documentary and get the word on because here they are going to map the sky again. So, it's it, you know, I don't know, man. I got to refresh me on the cosmic microwave background again. I know we've talked about it a couple times. Yeah, that's the documentary, The Principle. Came out in like 2017. And they mapped 360 degrees in the universe all around. Mm -hmm. And then it, they mapped the cosmic microwave background, which is the furthest edge of the universe. It's just microwaves. And apparently it's a background behind all the stars. So they mapped it, the heat signature of it. So they created a 360 degree interior model of the universe based on heat, red and blue. Mm -hmm. And it was basically yin-yang. It was basically balanced. It wasn't like random and chaotic. It was like balanced. And the conclusion was that it appears from our relative perspective that we are the center of the galaxy. Because if we're not, we should be able to see that we're closer to one side than the other side. They should be able to determine some kind of relative position based off of what the very outside edge of the universe looks like from our position, right? Just like a room, if right. you're in a corner, you would be like, it's just closer here and I can... But it, it, they can, it was like we're, we're just basically at the center according to this model. Which is really a mind fuck to think about. What, That's it, like a discovery you, In channel. your mind, what, what are the implications of that? Like, if that were to be true, that we exist at the center of the... Known universe, dude. I immediately think about Quetzalcoatl or some lizard god twelve thousand years ago, just like swimming around the pyramids, creating humanity. And I'm like, dude, I think all the ancient texts were true, man. We live in a bizarre world, and we actually have gods that created us before the great. That's what my first thought. Because like, if we're at the center of the universe, yeah. You got to like re imagine. Maybe the simulation theory is something to really consider. 
that's true, you know? It's just tobacco. Simulation theory, how would that play into that? Can you expound, please? If we exist in the center of the universe, from what we could see, from what we are able to observe, then maybe this is just some petri dish we were we were created in that I mean you, you don't you see where I'm going with that that it's kind of crazy that we would be, or, it or seems I, planned. I, I think I, yeah it seems planned or I think of like some divine intelligence or something that places us here you know what I mean exactly yeah so I'm, that's what that's where I'm going with the simulation theory like it's either you know, you can think of from a religious sense that God put us in the center of the universe and that's why we're the only observable intelligent life and we are the center of the universe and all this was created for us, I guess, which is a really weird way to think about it or it's just some simulation that we're placed inside of. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. It's fuck. But that's it, like a Discovery Channel documentary with Michio Kaku and this is not some YouTube documentary by some guy, you know, this was like mainstream came out and the conclusion was we're at the center of the universe. Could it be that Galileo might've been wrong? Galileo might've been right or something like that. It was, it, they tagged back to like an ancient theory because maybe we're not at the center of the galaxy. And we're moving. So we were not at the center and it's like, um, the other theory is that maybe just from our relative position, that's what it appears to be. And maybe if we move to another part of the universe, we would observe the same thing. Which right. leads into other cosmic dilemmas that are equally fascinating. I forgot where I was going, and I forgot what your question was, <laughs> but it it tags back to like Galileo and pre-Galileo, which if you're talking about that, you're talking about flat earth, you're talking about hollow earth, you're talking about a firmament. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's what yeah. gets me going is like, there's a lot to unpack there. Cause now I got to go back through the Bible and read what specifically these ancient texts have said about is earth at the center or, you know, like how does the cosmic microwave background map connect to any biblical predictions or things we've shrugged off ancient texts relating to the cosmos broad strokes but that's what makes i gotta clarify this because it just seems like there's more there and these ancient books like holy, holy shit they knew about the cosmic microwave background <clears throat> in the bhagavad gita and in the you know it seems like there's something there yeah i need to go watch that documentary and so i can get really acquainted with it yeah let's do an episode on it yeah i mean we can even maybe wrap it into the well no it would make sense so we wrap it into the Phil Schneider episode. Oh, we could because Phil Schneider talks about something. We'll, that we'll get in. Is, we'll get into that. Yeah, it gets into something that gets that could. I could we'll make it work. It. I could make it work. <laughs> I know you could. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's. So speaking of matter, then they have stars that we may have discovered that could be made of antimatter. Yeah, anti-stars could be lurking in the Milky Way. 14 points on a gamma ray map could potentially be stars made of antimatter. Let me get to the article right here. This could be the case when normal stars pull in antimatter with their gravity, which annihilates on the surface, producing some gamma ray bursts, similar to collecting in the center. But this is on the surface of stars, not exo planets and gas giants this would be a major blow to the cosmological model just like the cosmic microwave background they said this would be a major blow to the cosmic model they keep repeating this major blow to the co it's like they keep they're they're conditioning us to expect our understanding of reality to change soon now i'll ask you this and maybe you can what's the difference between antimatter and dark matter antimatter is the the exact the opposite, the opposite of charges. matter. Yeah, so like I don't know. I guess helium has an opposite, and it's the opposite but, of charges. But it and doesn't helium. exist in the same uh, same quantity as dark matter does in the universe, right? Because you know, you read through this article. Apparently, from 
over time, we believe that the ratio of matter now greatly outweighs that of antimatter. Yeah. And that's why it's, you know, we don't really observe it in the modern universe. Like it got lost. In fact, like it says it, the, the modern universe contains almost no antimatter. And they think that the universe has evolved in some process led to matter particles vastly outnumbering the antimatter alter egos. As well as we know these processes that destroy antimatter. So it's been destroying itself as well. So they had the, the International Space Station recently detected hints of an anti-helium nuclei. So the fact that that observation was confirmed uh, means that some of that antimatter could have been shed by, by anti-stars. Anti-stars, dude. Out of, they found 5,800 gamma ray sources and only 14 points of light gave off gamma rays. Uh, the energies were expected of matter-antimatter annihilation, but didn't look like any other known type of gamma ray source like a pulsar or black hole. Now, I love my pulsars. But this didn't have the characteristics of a pulsar. No, little outliers. What is it? It's, they estimate one anti-star out of 400,000 normal stars exists. Uh, that's hard to prove because the light no, of anti-stars... No, so, so there, there's two different... They, they, they think there's two different theories here that if an, anti-stars existed within the, the plane of the Milky Way where there's a lot of gas and dust made up of ordinary matter where those particles interact with antimatter particle and they emit those gamma rays, uh, that makes them easy to spot. Um, that as a result, the handful of detected candidates would imply that only one anti-star exists for every 400,000 normal stars. If, on the other hand, they tended to exist outside the plane of the galaxy where there's not as much normal matter for the uh, antimatter to interact with and annihilate, that would make them harder to find. So in that scenario, it could be only one anti-star lurking among every 10 normal stars. Which would make it more plentiful, but it's just harder for us to observe. It's just a matter of where they, I guess, tend to exist. Based on the findings from the Fermi telescope. Doesn't it say that they emit their own light as well? They do, which makes them almost impossible to, to determine their difference from a norm, normal star. The so only way weird. we can, The only way we can tell the difference is the that particular characteristics of the gamma rays that uh, of the normal matter interacting with the antimatter. If we, and, and if we're able to observe that, I guess that's how we're able to determine that it's an actual anti-star. That's the way I, I'm a dumbass. I don't know. That's, it, that's the way I uh, interpreted the article. It resonates to me like the arrow of time from last episode, how it goes in both directions. So it's like a helium molecule, and then on the back end, the anti-helium. It's like everything has the anti. And it seems like the same thing with... It seems like a different way of observing the arrow of time. Because arrow of time is more of like a philosophical concept with a couple of like statistical models, and this is like the same concept, but they're just observing it in uh, fucking antimatter and matter yeah i guess so um does that mean we have anti-carbon and like what we're made of there's an anti right here no i think that that's the whole i think that most antimatter over the development of the universe has disappeared and most of what we now there's dark matter i don't know how much of that we maybe have up in of us or in our observable universe but but no I don't think that we have antimatter electrons and protons I could be wrong I'm a dumbass I don't understand physics that deeply so I'm just basing that on these articles that I'm reading with you mm. trippy man I didn't realize it the universe trippy. was this crazy it's like every week I find these articles that really blow my mind again. 
The one that was hardest for me to understand was the new extra galactic circular radio source. So you want to explain that one to me? Yeah, where's my article? Maybe I didn't bring it up. Using the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, astronomers detected a new circular extragalactic radio source approximately 1 million light years in diameter. That's it's called a, huge. Yeah, it's called an odd radio circle. It's a large mysterious object that are bright along the edges at radio wavelengths. So... It looks like the outer edge of a galaxy glowing from the from the end cap of it, basically. Yeah, and they're observing radio this through the, you know, they're looking through the electromagnetic spectrum at radio wavelengths, specifically, yeah. which are like 300 or 30 hertz all the way to 300, uh, what is it, kilohertz or something like that, or gigahertz. Yeah, 300 gigahertz. Not visible by regular infrared or X-ray wavelengths. Only radio waves. They think it could be a relic lobe of a giant radio galaxy seen end on or a giant blast wave from a binary supermassive black hole merger. What the frick? It's this big glowing circle a million light years around. Yeah, and there's like odd. four, there, and there's several of them out there. There's like four or five of them, apparently. Dude, I hope we make peace with the aliens that are here and they tell us everything about because you know they know this shit. They'd be like, oh, blah, 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 blah. And then the top, something, Michio Kaku would be like, of course, it's brilliant. And then like everything would be obvious. And like, how did I did not think of that? It makes so much sense. The aliens would just be like, blah, blah, blah. Well, they don't talk, they use telepathy. But according to uh, what's his name? I'm that, telling uh, you, that, I'm telling you, man, we're going to, the aliens are going to give us all our divine knowledge back that the Roman Catholic Church well, learned. That's probably what the ancients were depicting in those pictographs and shit on the caves and the hieroglyphs were the aliens giving them knowledge before we got wiped out by global catastrophes. I love the universe, man. I hope aliens are real. I think they are. And what a wild place we live in, man. They're intergalactically traveling in crafts that we don't know how to make and break the sound. They break the sound barrier without booming. Yeah, it's like they're, they're manipulating, manipulating space-time. I mean, what sci-fi shit is that but happening in real life i mean the universe is far more insane than we give it credit for living down here on ordinary earth it's you know cool the saying? media the media still will still have you believe that it's a woo woo stupid story uh yeah it's just like see my thing about the th the, the, the thing about the crafts maybe being someone else's technology is okay maybe if ufos just started being a thing in 2020 Maybe, but back to the 50s, back to the 1900s, back to the 1500s, back all the way to ancient hieroglyphs and ancient texts. I mean, these sightings have been happening way longer than we've had any kind of technology to blame on China or Russia. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to account yeah. for a long history of sightings. If it's another country, it only makes sense if they just started happening like in the, after the year 2000. No, and there's been way too many sightings and too many credible sightings and cover-ups of evidence in the past that it, it's unlikely that it's another country. People getting killed. And the fact that we spend so many billions of dollars every year in intelligence in observing other countries and we are not able to observe them testing this type of technology or anything like that, I mean, I doubt that uh, another country has their hands on this technology. Although, I, I mean, I don't know, but... I mean, how would you keep it secret? 
if you're a country and you have this technology, what would you do with it? Would you fly it around military craft and spook them? Or would you like, what would you do with it? Use it to gather military intelligence, like uh, use it to infiltrate military airspace and observe military activities of other countries to gain leverage. Show up at random villages and scare an elementary school full of Tanzanian children. No, that's a, that's a that's a wild story, huh? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, these crabs are going a lot of places. That was a wild story, right? Yeah, we got to go into that one one day. Yeah, that was a wild one. I guess you could just listen to. I don't know. I, don't I know want to see my I own UFO. I, heard it. I want to yeah, see my luck. own UFO. Hey, go to New Mexico, man. Go where uh, we'll we'll talk about that on the um, the next episode. But go to New New Mexico where they Shit, supposed, supposedly have those bases. I'm going to go camping in the Cheyenne Mountains here in Denver, where they got them underground bases. Oh, there's supposedly some in Denver? Apparently, the Cheyenne Mountain conspiracy is one of the most prevalent when it comes to underground bases and what they're doing under the mountains. And, and that, that, that connects to Phil Schneider. We'll go into that. Bro, let's so, go. Let, let me come to your house, bro. We're going to go, take an episode and do a podcast in the Cheyenne Mountains right. as we go exploring. We just talk on our microphones. Underground on our military bases, the dumbs. Dude, deep bum, underground military. Bum, yeah, bum. the dumbs. Man. What a world. I watched the YouTube documentary just the other day about a UFO in England. And the military covered it up. What a shitty story I'm telling right now. It sounds like horse shit. But, hey man. Let me freaking... Uh, let me freaking go find it and get the name of it. Okay, oh, yeah. Subject. You got it. Why? Because you think it's going to sound like you're just pulling it out your ass? Well, it was super legit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it was super legit when I was watching it. And the, there was this like 10 minute excerpt of the lady telling her account of when she saw it. And there's like documents and shit about the government. The mili Oh, that's what it was. Military planes were doing a drill all over this town super late at night where, where at in, U, in the u.s i'm about or? to find that out it's like in england i'm oh, about in to england. find that out you just yeah. said that my bad the military had hardcore helicopters around flashing infrared and sitting over people's houses at like four in the morning how did they know they were flashing infrared people got it on camera and you can just see these flashes yeah but you can't see infrared flashes with your naked eye um, I don't know. I'd have to watch this video again and see what's up. But I think it was uh, maybe the actual military reports of the activity they did. But there was all these helicopters scanning and all the people in the town were online talking about it. So there's corroboration that the military was out there. So there was this investigation into the military reports of what happened that night. And the Basically, they were chasing these UFO spottings that also the whole town corroborates. Mm. Oh, so the town saw the UFOs? Yeah, and this lady said the military came and told her to be quiet in 18 months. She didn't talk about it, and then she came out talking about it, and then more people in the town came out talking about it. And um, mm. her story, but I was watching her talk about it because the lady that was making the documentary was like, can you tell me what happened? And she just didn't seem like she was lying. It was exactly like you're telling a true story. And it was a, a wild story, man. So Shit, what's the name of that uh, YouTube? Dude, let me just pull it up. Shit, my, my laptop's so slow. Yeah, I see that. Ten years old. Give it some time. Yeah. I'm going to cut this part um, out. Yeah, I know. It's like I'm about to start uh, just playing the Jeopardy music here. Um, I'm going to edit this part out. I'm torn between going and get my phone and just looking up. I've seen it go to my history and like to see the name of Is it. Is your computer just freezing? No, it's just going really slow because I'm streaming and 
mm. trying to load up a video thing service. I understand. Okay, so I'm almost there. It just got to my YouTube. Oh, I can't see any of that. That's why it's like, what the fuck is going on? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, uh, I have the Skype set to share those articles. Got you. Um, Not share a screen. I just clicked on my history. The Pinturk UFO incident from the Paranormal Scholar. The greatest UFO cover-up you've never heard of. Pinturk is the town in England. P-E-N-T-Y-R-C-H. And it was a good documentary. I watched the whole thing. I'll turn off a real bullshit documentary when it's obviously bullshit. Do you know? Right. Yeah, but I know. The journalist rule, it doesn't matter where the information comes from, focus on the information. So I try to give I try to give videos a, an honest shot. <laughs> Do you want me to screen share this article? Because I was just looking for the title. Oh, no, you're good. Uh, so I'm just going to... I guess I'll write that down. We'll talk about it next time. What's the uh, name of it? I mean, I, it's playing right now. I might as well just share it. I don't know if we'll be able to see the video, though. I thought, my, my bad. I thought you were about to just share the article. No, no, no. I'm switching the window. You see that? Yeah, I see it. That's Pin Turk. Yeah. Can you hear any audio? No. That's 30 minutes long, too. Hello? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dude, I turned the volume down on my computer to. Uh, and I was like, wait, where are you? That's hilarious. Shit. See, it's like uh, freezing right now. Yeah, but. don't worry about it. All right, so Pinturk, alien, alien, uh, or UFO sighting, Pinturk, military silencing. Got it. Uh, Good documentary. Pinturk Pin UFO incident. Sweet. Good doc. If anybody can debunk it and tell me I'm full of shit, please do, because as of right now, I'm sold. All right. It is in my history. You got it now? Yeah. No ice. No ice. Speaking of history, the fucking origin of COVID. Yes. Yes. That or, was, I, so I read that I read the whole long article like I just finished just before four, so Okay. Well, I don't have as, I don't have as extensive of notes. I didn't As finish you? the article. I got halfway through. Um, so I got the first half and it basically covers everything. So maybe you can pick up on the second half for whatever you remember. Sure. So first of all, I highly recommend everybody uh, out there listening. Go look up this article by Nicholas Wade on uh, actually, I think it's just Nicholas Wade dot medium dot com and look up origin of COVID following the clues um, and Nicholas Wade lays out a really compelling argument. Um, he actually, so he talks about the, the theories of both of the possible origins of COVID, right, that are out there. And he kind of tests both of those theories, does, a, does an intellectual exercise testing both of those theories, applying actual science, uh, virology science to it to really kind of understand which, which thread we should tug on more to understand where the pandemic came from. Um, he looked at the theory of it either being produced in a lab, which at first was largely dismissed as a conspiracy theory, probably mostly due to the fact that uh, former President Donald Trump was uh, a proponent of this theory. So immediately the media and everyone else picks up on the fact that they need to be against it because Trump was for something. So that must mean it's wrong. And then also he gets into the fact that there's there's some financial reasons why the both the science community, well, the science community would want to dispel this as well. And then he do, does a, a look at how how possible is it that this came from natural development, where it was developed in nature and jumped from animal to humans. 
so he tests both of those theories and does a it's a very long article yeah it's a good read it's uh you know it's about a 40 minute to an hour long read but it's worth it it's uh definitely the the probably the most in-depth uh piece of literature i've read about the origin of the coronavirus and it um it's definitely not a conspiracy piece uh it's very well written so i, I highly encourage everyone to go check it out i'll have the uh, notes below but there yes. was two two main two main kind of it was very similar to the boris johnson flawed data model we talked about a few episodes <clears> ago <throat> where they kind of isolated a couple scientists that had the wrong info that served their narrative and they ran with it. Right. This was very similar, but the American game plan. So there was the Lancet letter where scientists and organizations stood together against conspiracy theories drafted and organized. This Lancet letter was drafted and organized by Peter Daszak, president of the Eco Health Alliance of New York. His organization funded coronavirus research at the Wuhan Institute of Viral... Fuck, the Wuhan Institute of Virology... Um, and the Lancet letter also stated we have no competing interest, <clears throat> which it does, because if he's fun, again, like that was last episode where the investigator was one of the doctors that worked there. But they basically came out and said, we have no competing interest. And the whole thing is conflict of interest because you're funding he the funded, lab. He funded the lab. He funded some of this. Uh, but then he went on a campaign research. to say, to discount conspiracy theories and say, to save his ass. It was, it was a damage camp and we watched it in real time last year you know all these like it, did, well, it didn't come from a lab it didn't come from a lab it's very unlikely conspiracy theories conspiracy theories okay. and now what's the talk Fauci funding Wuhan 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 Wuhan's trending yeah, well so, Fauci, so that, and so Fauci also funded this through the NIH as well which this, yeah, this type we'll of that. research which we're getting to and then Dr. Christian G. Anderson was, a, was another one on March 17th 2020 um, he said, we know it is not a manipulated virus or a lab construct. While other methods of gene copy pasting show marks of manipulation, newer methods called noceum or seamless show no marks. So there's basically no way to know if it was manipulated or not because new ways don't show those marks. But there are other ways to kind of extrapolate that argument. Uh, Dr. Anderson was assuring the public of something there's no way of knowing. They said it was improbable later that SARS-CoV-2 emerged through lab manipulation. Right after they said it was absolutely not true, they said it was improbable. It kind of changed their story. Then claims the virus did not bind in the maximally calculated way science, scientists could make it. So basically, one of his arguments was that the virus will bind naturally. And the way these spike proteins did the binding was not maximal like wasn't perfect we, yeah it wasn't yeah, like, perfect like, like it wasn't in, genetically engineered to be perfect but to maximize its potency so that was his argument was because it's not perfect it's natural which is a poor argument but that was one of the poor arguments that but that's not the way so the way that virologists go about research yeah they don't even so calculate like they he don't said. they it's not even like a calculation, like he said, because the way they we can basically use natural, so they do use natural yeah. selection, right? So yeah, you can like put the virus, and then like the one that works the best, they keep that one, right? And then they keep going until they get going, a strong. Keep one. going, keep going, right? So the way he worded it was, it didn't happen the way a scientist would calculate maximum. Points. But that was in in in, in disingenuous. In, disingenuous. They because, don't calculate period. Right. So it's interesting little half truce that they put out there like what but and then the, the media takes it and that's like that's the yeah. science trust the science you guys are conspiracy theorists for suggesting this comes from a lab anyway so the second argument um is that let's see what was the second argument here although all the wait, most wait. living thing, oh, go ahead sorry um i, I think notes. you're skipping maybe you maybe you have the same thing is it rna and dna yeah okay go ahead so all the most living things use DNA as their her hereditary material. A number of viruses use RNA, which is DNA's close chemical cousin. Uh, D RNA is difficult to manipulate, so researchers working on coronaviruses, which are RNA-based, will first convert RNA gen genome, genome to DNA. Then they manipulate the DNA version, whether by adding or altering genes, and then arrange for the manipulated DNA genome to be converted back into infectious RNA. But only a certain number of these DNA backbones have been described in the scientific literature. Anyone manipulating the SARS-2 virus would probably, would quote, probably have used one of these known backbones. And it's easy to do. So just because 
it wasn't in that published paper as one of the 14 backbones. It didn't. So, the, you know, let, yeah, the, the, he goes on to say DNA that. backbones are quite easy to make. So it's yeah. obviously possible that it was SARS-2 was manipulated using an unpublished DNA backbone. Basically, the RNA is really hard to manipulate. So they got to convert it to DNA, create a backbone and then convert it back to RNA. So that's what the backbone term is. And that's going to come up a little bit when they talk about the backbone. People can just get a yeah. backbone, backbone, backbone. But, so uh, his anyway, paper so stated 14 backbones and it's easy this, to do. So it doesn't mean nothing. Yeah. And this, all this research is, is what's known as a uh, gain of function research. Yeah. Do you have notes on that you want to go into? Yeah. It gets into the next section, the doubts about the natural emergence theory, because China came out and pushed the natural emergence. But the just about what, what gain of function research is in general, like so that people kind of know. Yeah, gain. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just ripped my scab off and my hand is bleeding. I got nervous and ripped it off. Look at that shit. I was like, Why is my hand wet on my shirt? Go ahead I'm and take a, care of that. I'm a man, bro. I'm just going to let it bleed. <laughs> All right. So, podcast. gain of function is where you try to make a virus more potent on purpose. Right. Basically. And why would someone, why would, why would anyone go and do that? What's they the, would the do that because time? they can understand more about the potential spillover of a virus. They make it stronger, they understand more, and they can prepare for a worst case scenario. And ultimately, so gain of function research is of no value based off of this pandemic. Because That's exactly gain, what I was getting at. Like, the gain of function is supposed to protect us from the virus, but really the risk of it escaping is more detrimental than just leaving shit the fuck alone because it wasn't that bad in nature. Like, why make it worse to protect us from the yeah. not as bad version? And then of also, we were, the studying, risk, we were studying novel coronaviruses that come from bats in a fucking lab. And how much benefit did that get us during this pandemic? None. Hey, but exactly. that comes up later, so, and I have an interesting theory about how the vaccine got made so quick. It'll remind me later. Um, that does come up later. Got you. More about so that. science. So the whole thing is like, why would why would uh, scientists want to like dismiss the lab leak theory? Well, it's because of funding. It, com it comes down to money at the end of the day. Because yeah, well, I mean, that's what we said whenever Peter Daszak came out with a campaign to dismiss a lab leak theory, and he's the one funding the lab. And the doctor that was part of the investigation team was working in the lab. This conflict of interest to cover their ass because they fucked up. That's basically what's happening. Yeah, so any virologist or scientist that steps out of line with that, you know, potentially potentially risk losing lose, losing funding for their research. So obviously they don't want this lab leak theory to come out and they don't want to face the wrath of the public because of it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't either. No. I mean, Shit. 3 million people lost their lives. Dude, I spilled somebody's food once at a restaurant. I felt terrible. I can't imagine like, oh, sorry, world. Sorry, Oops. we let a virus slip out that killed 3 million people. Whoops. I remember Oopsie it was like second grade eating lunch on the floor and I get up and my foot kicks the guy's food and I'm like sorry I felt so bad dude can you imagine I letting a, imagine. a pandemic slip out That's but so there was those two theories um, the doubt about a natural emergence occurred when uh, the WHO they had a commission sent to China February 2021 and the commission members was controlled by China heavily its members included Peter Daszak he continually asserted that the lab escape theory was extremely unlikely, but the Chinese came to have no evidence to support this. 15 months later, SARS-1 and MERS, M-E-R-S, left a lot of traces in the environment. So this was surprising. SARS-1's host was discovered four months after the 2000 outbreak. MERS-9 months after the 2012 outbreak. SARS-CoV-2 undiscovered any host even 15 months later after extensive research. Chinese researchers failed to find the original population of bats or the intermediate species to which SARS-2 jumped or any serological evidence that the Chinese population, particularly Wuhan, had been exposed to the virus prior to December 19. So if it did happen naturally, they should have found something by now and they're kind of left empty handed because they're dismissing the lab leak theory and their theory has no evidence 
And they're like, what the fuck? So the article says they effectively recreated the 1918 flu virus, demonstrated how polio can be resynthesized, which is like, uh, I don't know, polio is basically like the flu, basically the meningitis. Mm -hmm. And they mixed smallpox genes into the virus. And that clicked with me because I had COVID. I know I had it. My wife was tested and I got what she had. And I had a rash. And I was like, why the rash? And that must be the smallpox. No, so that's not, I think you misunderstood that part of the article right there, if I'm being honest with you. Because that, that part, so that part is talking about like, why would they want to do gain of function research basically, right? So ever since, it, it, before that it states that ever since virologists have gained tools for manipulating a virus's genes, they argued that, that they could get ahead of a potential pandemic by exploring how, a given animal virus might make the jump to humans, and that has justified lab experiments in enhancing the ability of dangerous animal viruses to infect people. So it's just talking about, in general, the different types of animal viruses that they have gone on to recreate, like the flu virus, the 1918 flu virus, like the polio virus, and the smallpox gene virus. So this is just talking about different gain-of-function research they have done on different animal viruses so they have I'm gone and rec- they've they have gone and recreated those those viruses so that they could better understand them and they could better understand how they could potentially make the jump to humans mm. so it's, it's not saying that they engineered the current sars-2 virus with a smallpox gene yeah okay it's saying that they they were they recreated but COVID has that rash, and I had that rash, so I was like... I'm sure it was. does. I just don't think that that was part of... I don't think it came from that, in other words. There was particular interest in the spike proteins of coronavirus. They pop out all around the molecule, and they target specific species. In 2000, Dutch scientists developed the spike protein of a mouse so that it can attack only cats. In 2015, University of North Carolina, this is where it gets interesting, Dr. Shi and Ralph Barrett created a novel virus from the backbone of SARS-1, replaced its sprite protein with that of a bat virus, SHC-014 COV, having the ability to affect human airway. So it was kind of the first prototype of uh, COVID. So if the SARS-CoV-2 virus was cooked up in their lab, SHC-014 slash SARS-1 was its direct prototype. Hmm. So they were doing exact yeah. research on this exact type of virus. Yeah. In uh, the exact sta- area where they had an outbreak. And, yeah, it's, it's, and you're still considered a conspiracy theorist if you yeah. entertain the lab leak hypothesis. Yeah. There was a, a statement from Dr. Sheehan Barrick that said, in developing policies moving forward, it's important to consider the value of the data generated by these studies whether these types of chimeric virus studies warrant further investigation versus the inherent risks involved. So they were openly talking about this is really, really risky business. We're not sure if it's worth it. And that yeah. was 2015. I mean, other scientists like knew that this could be a problem with this type of research. And then the potential, yeah. potential risks outweigh the benefits. Obviously, they outweigh the benefits. I mean, I, I'd say that they outweigh the benefits. Like now, we it's proven that it outweighs the benefits, considering that we were doing active research on bat coronaviruses in these labs that were stu- doing this gain yeah. of function research, and we didn't get anything from it that helped us with the pandemic. Just the pandemic, as far as I know. As far as I know. So, so much for being ready to save except us for, from except for worst maybe case the pan- yeah, except, except for maybe the pandemic itself. Yeah, it's insane. Barrick, uh, he's basically, he developed the method for engineering bat coronavirus to attack human cells. He taught it to Dr. Xi, and then Dr. Xi took off with the research. She, the targets were human cells grown in cultures and mice genetically engineered to carry the human version of a protein called ACE2 that sticks to the surface of cells that lie in airways. So they designed mice specifically to receive this maximally so they can like really make sure it works i mean i mean wow this is something else but this is the money trail basically right here because she's work her work was funded by the national institute of allergy and infectious disease which is a part of the national institute of health the grant money for her state specifically said what the plan was um the 
they were assigned to the prime contractor, Dr. Dashik, of the Eco Health. So the money came from him. Yeah, Who subcontracted the grants to she. And there's a couple a, of quotes. Did you want to read those quotes? Yeah, we can read the quotes, uh, or we could just read the meat. You know, I like how he just kind of lays it out and. Well, I like to language. put the quotes because okay, that's so the actual source in quotes, of fact. In quotes, this is the fact. This is exactly what the grant was for. It was in quotes test predictions of cove interspecies transmission, predictive models of host range, i.e., emergence potential, will be tested experimentally using reverse genetics, pseudovirus, and receptor binding assays, and virus infection experiments across a range of cell cultures from different species and humanized mice. We will use S protein sequence data, infectious clone technology, in vitro and in vivo infection experiments, and analysis of receptor binding to test the hypothesis that percent divergence thresholds in S protein sequences predict spillover potential. You can break that down in non technical language. Yeah, so that means Dr. Xi meant to create novel coronaviruses with the highest possible infectivity for human cells. That's really fucked up. Uh, her plan was to take genes that coded for these certain spike proteins that had a variety of measured affinities for human cells. So basically the ones that really attach to humans. She would insert the spike genes one by one into the backbone of several viral genomes, which is basically reverse genetics or the infectious clone technology. Uh, that created a series of chimeric viruses the virus has been tested for their ability and then in vivo and in vitro, which I finally learned what that was, in vitro was taking place inside a tube, culture dish, or elsewhere outside a living organism, and in vivo is in the organism. So they tested both in, the, in a dish and in the mice. So that helped them predict the likelihood of spilling over from bats to humans. The, the research by Dr. Xi was meant to find the best chimeric viruses that attack human cells. SARS-2 like viruses were created in this lab and SARS-2 itself very well likely was created in this lab. Dr. Xi's records are sealed, so it is yet impossible to know whether she created SARS-2 or not. And then there's two more quotes. Uh, these were good quotes. I put asterisks around these. It is clear that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was systematically constructing novel chimeric coronaviruses and was assessing their ability to infect human cells and human ACE2 expressing mice. Uh, it's also clear that depending on the constant genomic context, this work could have, been, could have produced SARS-CoV-2 or a progenitor. Genomic context refers to the particular viral backbone. Um, and then Peter Daszak comes back in 2019. In an interview, spoke highly of the Wuhan Institute, Wuhan Institute of Virology researchers that were uh, reprogramming the spike protein this is months before the yeah he was praising the he said, virus we have outbreak. Now, he said uh, we have now found you know after six or seven years of doing this over 100 new SARS related coronaviruses very close to SARS some of them get into human cells in the lab some of them can cause SARS disease in humanized mice models and are untreatable with therapeutic not monoclonals and you can't vaccinate against them with the vaccine so these are a rare and present danger the interviewer says the, you say these are diverse coronaviruses and you can't vaccinate against them and no antivirals, so what do we do? He says, well, I think coronaviruses, you can manipulate them in the lab pretty easily. Spike protein drives a lot of what happens with coronavirus. Spike protein drives a lot of what happens with coronavirus. And zoonic risk, I don't know what zo zoonotic. And zoonotic risk, that basically means the spike proteins, uh, which are the little, which would bind to the cells, or what drive what happens in zoonotic risk, which is the the risk of jumping from animals to humans. Mm, I see. He goes on to say, you can get the sequence, you can build the protein. We work a lot with Ralph Barrick at UNC to do this. Insert into the backbone of another virus and do some work in the lab. You can get more predictive when you find a sequence. He basically goes on to say, once you have it nailed, then you can take the spike protein and make a vaccine. And that's what my theory about the vaccine, why they were able to make it so fast under Trump, who knew it was made in the lab, because they already had the spike protein needed to make a vaccine. Whereas when it's in nature and they have to discover it and break it down and do all this, 
it'll take five to six years. That's my theory of why they did it so fast. Yeah, you're you're right. Because that's had... what he says. That's what Dr. Dashik says right here. It's like once you get the spike protein after doing all this shit that we've been paying Barrick to do since 2015. Billions five years, of dollars. Six years. Five or six years. That's how long it takes. Six or seven years. He yeah. Said. Yeah. So, I mean, come on. From the devil's mouth himself. Only yeah. a few days later from this interview did the outbreak in Wuhan happen, dude. Instead of providing health authorities with the information that he knew, he went on a campaign to discredit this theory. In 2019, in an interview, he stated the idea that the virus escaped from the lab is just pure baloney. It's simply not true. And that's the interview with Trump you were talking about. Trump came mm -hmm. out and dropped a major bomb. Love him or hate him. Yeah. Same thing with Alex Jones. Love him or hate him. I think they're right most right. of the time. Sometimes, yeah. So then it gets then the article breaks into the safety arrangements at Wuhan Institute of Virology, which were uh, not good to say the least. Uh, they had a safety violation, or not a safety violation, but uh, a concern. They said the new lab has. They had just built a BSL BSL four lab, and upon its inspection, its readiness was uh, considered. Uh, it alarmed the State Department, and they said the new lab has a serious shortage of appropriately trained technicians and investigators needed to safely operate this high containment laboratory. So, just uh, as we go into this safety, you know, discussion, there are four degrees of safety designated from BSL one to BSL four, which BSL four being the most restrictive, and that's designed for deadly pathogens like the Ebola virus. Yeah. Crack it open a beer. Yes. I forgot it's like six over there. It's beer time. It is six. So I just checked my video and it failed to export because my computer ran out of hard drive space somehow, mm. even though I was bouncing it to my hard drive. So another mystery. Another mystery. Sorry, man. <laughs> it's okay. I'll figure it out. I hit bounce again, so I'm gonna try again. Um Okay, let's get back in it. I We were talking about the safety, and that's where I didn't read, so take it away, good sir. Yeah, yep. so there are there are four levels of the safety, BSL-01 to BSL-04. BSL um, you know, it goes on to talk about how, you know, virologists don't like to work in BSL-04 labs. Not safe. Because you have to wear a space, you have to wear a space suit, you have to do operations in closed cabinets and everything takes twice as long. So basically the rules assigning each kind of virus given like to a safety suit. level were pretty laxer. They were yes, but that's that's a BSL BSL three, actually, right there. No, it says Dr. Zhang Yishi in a high safety level BSL four lab. Mm. The caption. Oh wait, her coronavirus research was done in the much lower safety levels of B her research was done in the BSL mm -hmm. two and BSL three, but that's what we're talking about. But her, this picture is her in a BSL four. Got gotcha. you. Okay, so, so that's BSL four. Yes. Yeah. She's got some so DSLs. They don't, in that but they BSL. don't, but they don't like to work in though. <laughs> they don't like to work in BSL four labs because it's pain in the ass, basically. So the way they designate these viruses, they basically just just to make make it easier to work on them, they they designate them under lower safety levels so that it's easier to work on them. And uh, that's how we ended up working on basically SARS-CoV-2 variants in BSL-2 safety levels. So um, that's not safe. Uh, so basically... BSL, so, a bio, so BSL-2 safety level is about the equivalent of a standard U.S. dentist's office. Just for a comparison, so just imagine that we're working on ah. co we're working on COVID <laughs> in the equivalent of a standard dentist office environment. Damn. So not very safe. Hey, they wear their mask in a dentist office, though. Mm, do they? 
pre-pandemic when they get close to you they, they got one on right when they're cleaning mm-hmm. your teeth and eh, they got one right no i don't remember probably either man i don't remember because now everything is just I, I just remember it from the mask perspective now that might be a good question to go around and ask people for a video and see how no one actually can remember and then title it no one knows what dennis the war pre-pandemic like what what's this yeah, so it said before 2020, the rules followed by virologists in China and elsewhere required that experiments with SARS-1 and MERS viruses be conducted in BSL-3 conditions. But all other bat coronaviruses could be studied in BSL-2, which is the next level down. And uh, BSL-2 requires fairly minimal safety precautions, such as wearing lab coats and gloves, not sucking up liquids in a pipette, and putting a biohazard warning signs but gain of function ex- uh, research conducted in bsl2 on viruses might produce a more infectious agent than either sars1 or mers and if it did then you have lab workers that are exposed to high chances of infection if they're unvaccinated which we know that they are because it's very difficult for them to create vaccinations per dr peter or from earlier in the article Peter Daszak. Peter Daszak. Daszak, however you want to say it. I don't know how to say his last name. It sounds like a real douchey last name, this fucking guy, Daszak. So, yeah, in 2000, uh, in, on January 15th, 2021, the U.S. government uh, said they had reason to believe that researchers inside the Wuhan Institute of Virology became sick in autumn of 2019 before the first identified case of the outbreak with symptoms consistent with both COVID-19 and common seasonal illnesses. So knowledge of that incident came from a mix of public information and some high, high-end information collected by our intelligence community. Uh, Three people working at a BSL-3 lab at the Institute fell sick within a week of each other with severe symptoms that required hospitalization. This was the first known cluster that we're aware of, of victims that we believe to be COVID-19. Influenza could not be completely ruled out, but seemed unlikely in the circumstances. So, interesting stuff. And then, uh, I like this next section here. Did you read any of this? No, I just, I didn't get here, man. Gotcha. Sorry, you outdid me, man. I would have got to it if I didn't have to go walk the dog, but I had to go walk the dog. So no, I just finished. No, I'm not an expert. Like I just finished this shit right before the podcast, reading it right before the podcast. It's a long so, article. Like we're at very, the halfway very point right now, and I don't. So he he talks about four tests of uh, the two hypotheses. The two hypotheses being whether the the natural. You want to share your part, your part, part in the article? Because I'm trying to follow with you and I don't know where you are. How about you share your article? Sure. I can follow where you're at. I'm right here. Boom. So, yeah, the, the two hypotheses being either the lab leak or the natural uh, occurrence. So he talks about the place of origin. So yes. we can talk about this, starting with the geography, the... The two closest known relatives of the SARS virus were collected from bats living in caves in Yunnan, a province in southern China, which is uh, 1,500 miles away from Wuhan. That's where Dr. Xi was continuously going to caves to get bats for this. She did her work in Yunnan. Yunnan. Yeah, and it it talks about if if the first people infected were people around the Yunnan caves that would that would strongly support that idea that the virus spilled over to people naturally but uh, that isn't what happened since the pandemic broke out in Wuhan 1500 miles away um, let's see here that bat the bat that it came from which is rhino rhinolophus affinis which is or I guess commonly known as a horseshoe bat its range is at best uh, 50 kilometers so it's unlikely it made its way into Wuhan um, and then whenever the cases started arising the temperatures in that province were already cold enough to send bats into hibernation so these are all factors pointing a- away from the fact that this could have came from a bat migration kind so of. then it talks about alright what about if it infected some intermediate host 
Well, you would need a long-standing population of bats in frequent proximity with an intermediate host, which must in turn cross paths with people. All of these exchanges would have taken place somewhere outside of Wuhan. Um, and then the infected person or, ca- uh, or animal carrying this transmissible virus would have had to travel back to Wuhan without infecting anyone else along the way. So it, no one in his or her family got sick, and no one on that person, if they were on a train or anything, got sick along the way. So that's a stretch yeah. to say that it jumped to a host. But if you consider the lab escape scenario, then the, the Wuhan origin is a no-brainer. It is home to China's leading center of coronavirus research, um, where they were engineering bad coronaviruses to attack human cells. But we're conspiracy theorists for cons- considering it uh they were doing so under the minimal safety conditions of a bsl2 lab oh buddy we're domestic right-wing terrorists yeah if a virus <laughs> with the unexpected infectiousness of sars to have been generated there its escape would be no surprise so the that's a that's just that alone to me is pretty compelling evidence on why you'd want to look into the lab escape scenario then it talks about natural history and evolution. Uh, viruses don't just make a one-time jump from one species to another. It has to go through different mutations, uh, often which they fail. And then it, it, a lot of that comes, it changes its RNA units. Uh, let's see, blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Several more mutation-driven adjustments. The virus adapts to its new host, uh, which you could say bats, which come in frequent contact. Um, then the the pull process resumes as the virus moves from this to a, in, to an intermediate host of people. In the case of SARS one, researchers had uh, they they were able to document all of the steps that it had taken uh, to get go from uh, bats to civets, and then yeah. six changes in its spike protein to where it eventually made its way to people. And then whenever it made its way to people, it evolved fourteen more times. So we we're able to track all that. But when you look for fingerprints similar in SARS-2, uh, there's, it, the virus has hardly changed at all since its inception, which mm. means it was already very well adapted to human cells. Which, which is would interesting. Make sense if they that, were developing it to be optimal to attack human cells in a lab. So that immediately makes me think about all of this mutation, mutation, mutation talk. Is that some fake narrative to cover up the fact that it's not fucking changing at all like it should be? Well, it, it recently it has been changing. This this article goes on to talk about it's changing a little oh. now. But, but yeah, it's it's basically... So researchers were saying that compared with SARS-1, it was relatively well adapted to human cells by the point of its inception. Like Brother Hump first found out about it. It was pre-adapted to human trans- transmission extent to a similar uh, to an extent similar to that of the late original SARS COVID pandemic. Um, let's see. Not to mention early strains identified show that limited genetic diversity suggests yeah. the virus may have been introduced from a single source. So it's toxically it's white source. and male. <laughs> it reeks of to- toxic white masculinity, misogyny, and transphobe. It's a white national Nazi virus. Read that again. No diversity. Got you. I like how you're uh, you're tying that into this, but anyway, proponents of natural emergence suggest that the incubated yet to be found human population before. Uh, Suggests that SARS-2 incubated in a yet-to-be-found human population before gaining its special properties, or that it jumped to a host animal outside China. Uh, that's possible, but it's strained. So, I mean, the lab leak obviously has a simpler explanation. SARS-2 was adapted to human cells from the start because it was grown in humanized mice, and lab cultures are uh, of human cells, just like they talked about in the grant proposal for Dr. Dazic. That third theory there is the one I really like to bury my face in and research. It's interesting. The Ferrin Cleavage site. So you know about this one, right? No, I saw the word cleavage. No, I understand, but this is the most interesting part. 
Um, so I, I have to do a lot of reading on this one because I'm too dumb to like paraphrase it, but um, the fur and cleavage site is part of the virus's anatomy that really influences its infectivity. It's in the middle of that spike, like directly in the middle of that spike protein. Um, the spike protein has two subunits called S1, which rec- uh, which they do two different things. S1 recognizes the virus tar- virus's target, which are basically the cells lining the human airways in your lungs. And S2 helps the virus, once it's anchored to the cell, to fuse with the membrane. And I guess uh, once the membrane has coalesced with the stricken cell, the vi- viral genome is injected into the cell, which hij- hijacks its protein-making machinery and allows the gyrus to recreate itself. After the invasion, uh, but the invasion can't begin until S1 and S2 have been cut apart. And there at the junction is something called a furin cleavage site that ensures the spike protein will be cleaved in exactly the right place. So in the virus model uh, doesn't carry its own cleaver. It's, and it's a really efficient design, the fact that it's designed like this. It actually has human cells do the cleaving for it which uh, human cells have a tool known as the furin that, that does this. And furin will cut any protein chain that carries its signature target cutting site. And it's a specific sequence of amino acids, proline, arginine, arginine, and alanine, or PRRA, which are the letters that they use to, to, to designate that. And that's the specific sequence that I guess triggers human cells to, to, to activate that cleaving process to start the, you know, the infection process of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this is pretty detailed genetic yeah. engineering of a virus. Right. So viruses have all kinds of clever tricks. So why does the, that stand out? Because of all known SARS-related beta coronaviruses, only SARS-2 possesses a furin cleavage site. All other viruses have their S2 unit cleaved at a different site and by a different mechanism. So how did it get that site? It was either evolved naturally or it was inserted by researchers at the S1, S2 injunction in a gain-of-function experiment. Whoa. So if you consider its natural origin, uh, viruses evolve by either mutation or recombination. Mutation is the process of random change in DNA or RNA for coronaviruses that results in the amino acids in a protein change being switched for another. Uh, many of the changes harm the virus, but natural selection retains the few that do something useful. Uh, mutation is the process by which the SARS-1 spike protein gradually switched its preferred target cells, uh, which I guess are figured out by S1, from bats to civets and then to humans. Uh, Mutation seems less likely for the furin cleavage site to be generated, even though it can't be completely ruled out. The four amino acids are all together and all at the right plight, all at the exact right place in the S1, S2 junction. And mutation is a random process triggered by copying errors when new viral genomes are being generated or by chemical decay of genomic units. So it typically affects single amino acids at different spots in a protein change. A string of amino acids like that of the furin cleavage site is much more likely to be acquired altogether through quite a different process known as recombination. And then it goes on. I know this is getting kind of detailed, but I think this part is kind of compelling when you like look at the structure of the virus. So that's why I'm taking the time to read it. So sorry if it's getting kind of boring. What other podcast do you find this shit on? I don't know. None. None. So recombination is an inadvertent swapping of genomic materials that occurs when two viruses happen to invade the same cell and their progeny are assembled with bits and pieces of RNA belongings to the other. Beta coronaviruses will only combine with other beta coronaviruses but can can acquire by recombination almost any genetic element present in the collective genomic pool. What they cannot acquire is an element the pool does not possess. So since no known SARS-related beta coronavirus is the class with which SARS-2 belongs to, possesses a furin cleavage site, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, right, for that process to work if there are no other known beta coronaviruses that possess that site for it it to recombine with and and possess those elements. Right. It's not like the virus is out to mate with its own kind basically 
That's what it sounds like. It's not meant to like combine with its own and make more and survive. It's just meant to go attack humans, period. And if it was yeah, a natural it virus... Actually, it, it talks it about would, that right here. Like you said, it's designed to attack humans specifically. Proponents say that it could have picked up the site as as of yet unknown beta coronavirus, but bat SARS related beta coronaviruses don't need a furin cleavage site to infect bat cells. So there's no great likelihood that any of them possess one, and that's why we haven't found one so far. Because to infect bats, they don't need that. So you're right. It was it was like it was designed specifically to go directly after human cells. Wow. This is like a smoking gun, dude. Yeah. dude what would you do if you're watching it's funny CNN? You say that it's a smoking gun because there's a doctor down here that says that in this article. He, he says that the 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 whatever this is called, the furin cleavage site is the smoking gun that show, that oh. shows that this was made in a lab. Anyway, I'm not going to read the rest of that part. Go look into it. There's a lot more in there. There's a lot more. And I don't want this to be a five-hour podcast, but um, it goes on, number four, which this is another complex one that I won't read and get all the way into, is the question of codons. Um, <sighs> this one gets really, really detailed, so I won't go too too into it here. Let's see if Bust it up, a... baby. I'm curious. I see math equations and acronyms, and it looks like, it looks like a really deep breakdown of a football game. It's like, why does all this stuff matter? Let's see. Um, there's basically... different amino acids that... are groupings of amino acids that they find... or sequences of them that they find that are specific to SARS-2 that couldn't have been picked up from other cousins of SARS-2, like through natural selection. So it just it's more factors that point to the fact that this, the, the two, let's see, there's a factor of these codons that make it more effective at, at attacking human cells, and it's not found in any of the other SARS viruses. It's just like the fewer and cleavage site, just another component of it. Yeah, um, there are several curious features about this insert, but the oddest is the, that of the two side-by-side -side CGG codons. Only 5% of SARS-2 ar arginine codons are CGG, and the double codon CGG-CGG has not fa been found in any other beta coronavirus. So how did SARS-2 acquire a pair of arginine codons that are favored by human cells but not by coronaviruses it seems like it would have the ones favored by coronaviruses if it naturally evolved from coronaviruses right. it would match the pattern but it's it's the ones that are favored by human cells yeah i mean this is what the news should be talking about right Pro yeah proponents of natural emergence have an uphill task to explain all of the features of the sars 2 fear and cleavage site they have to postulate a recombination event at a site on the virus's genome where recombinations are rare and the insertion of a 12 nucleotide sequence with a double organine codon unknown in the beta coronavirus repertoire at the only site in the genome that would significantly expand the virus's infectivity. Yes, but your wording makes this sound unlikely. Viruses are specialists at unusual events, is a repost of David L. Robertson, a, vir a virologist at the University of Glasgow, who regards lab escape as a conspiracy theory. Recombination is naturally very, very frequent in these viruses. There are recombination breakpoints in the spike protein, and these codons appear unusual exactly because we've not sampled enough. I guess this is a motherfucker that is... Is he uh, trying to dismiss it? Yeah, yeah. He's. I think he's probably someone who's a proponent of gain-of-function research. What a fucking asshole. Can you read what he said again? He said that... Viruses are specialists at unusual events. Recombination okay. is naturally very, very frequent in these viruses. There are recombination breakpoints in the spike pro in the spike protein, and these codons appear unusual exactly because we've not sampled enough. So he's like, "Oh, it's an anomaly in nature because we don't know enough yeah. about it." And since we don't know enough about it, we just went ahead and took millions of government dollars and uh, 
created them in a lab that wasn't safe since we didn't know a lot about them. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, yeah. Doc Roberts. And this, it goes on arguing, this argument could be pushed too far. Any result of a gain-of-function experiment could be explained as one that evolution could have arrived at in time. And the numbers game can be played in the other way. For the Fuhrer and Cleavage site to arise naturally in SARS-2, a chain of events has to happen, each of which is quite unlikely for the reasons given above. A long chain with several improbable steps is unlikely to ever be completed. For the lab escape scenario, the double CGG codon is no surprise. The human preferred codon is routinely used in labs, so anyone who wanted to insert a furin cleavage site into the virus's genome would synthesize the PRRA making sequence in the lab and would be likely to use CGG codons to do so. And then you talked about the smoking gun. When I first saw the furin cleavage site in the viral sequence with its R arginine codons, I said to my wife, it was a smoking gun for the origin of the virus. Said David Baltimore, an eminent virologist and former president of Caltech. Caltech. These Leave it features, up to California. These features make a powerful, powerful challenge to the idea of a natural origin for SARS-2. So. I would say that's an understatement. That's they uh, they introduce a third scenario of origin that he, he this, I like that this guy's you know looking at all all yeah. all of the possible scenarios. The guy who kind of dismissed it earlier, David Robertson, believes that SARS two could have trans been transmitted directly from bats to people, um, and because bats are widely distributed in southern and central China, the virus had ample opportunity to jump to people, even though. It seems to have done so on only one known occasion. And that would explain why no one has so far found a trace of SARS-2 in any intermediate host or in human populations surveilled before December 2019. And it would also explain the fact that oh. why SARS-2 hasn't changed since it first appeared in humans, the fact that it wouldn't need to because it could have already attacked human cells efficiently. One explain, problem with this whoa, whoa, idea... Say that again? We were talking earlier about how it has not mutated or has not yeah. changed much, right? Yeah. Like SARS-1 had mutated 14 times when it got to humans. But this one's just starting to mutate now. But uh, it talks about that it wouldn't have needed to change much because the, it would have already been efficient at attacking human cells. Well, but he says one, are they one saying, problem with that. Are, what? Are, are they saying that just right away it was good to go? It would never have had to... Evolve. That sounds like what it's saying. Like from the get go, yeah, it is. It is. That's what it's saying. That's and that's why I was able to jump straight from bats to humans because it was already evolved to the point where it was able to do so. And, and which is why they don't water. find it in any host animals because it didn't jump. But one problem with that is that if it were if SARS jumped from bats to people in a single leap and it hasn't changed much, it should still be good at infecting bats, and it isn't. Mm. Bat species are poorly infected by SARS-CoV-2, and it they're seems... likely to be a direct source for human infection. So, it's it, bats are, don't catch COVID very well, which would mean that it would be weird if it, since it hasn't changed much, for it to have, have come from them. It's. It, I mean, I'm no doctor, but it seems to me that the natural origin theory doesn't hold up. Yeah. It also seems that being created in a lab does hold up. I think where the there's just no direct evidence for either. The only and that and that's the conclusion of this article. Is, well, they need to unseal Doctor She's paperwork. It's not the fault of an anomaly in nature and our lack of understanding that there's well, no here's conclusive it, evidence. It, it's the it, fault of the institution that sealed her files that won't let well, them. Right. It's, so it actually talks about that. Chinese virologists are at fault, and they're uh, to blame for performing gain-of-function experiments in low-level safety conditions, um, which, you know, if SARS-2 did escape from the lab, then they deserve the public shaming that they get. Um, Chinese authorities for sweeping it under the rug and closing the records on it so that we don't understand where it came from 
and that we won't be able to prevent this from happening another another time. And we're continuing to dump money into gain of function research and not correcting the problem from where it came from. They're to fucking blame for this too. Yeah. The, like, and then the worldwide community of virologists because that none of them stepped up and actually said anything about it, uh, about stopping both this gain of function research and even looking into this lab leak hypothesis. And then it, uh, our, our role in funding, the U.S.'s role in funding the, U, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where you have Anthony Fauci funding it through the NIH, or actually through the NIAID, part of the NIH, and continuing to and trying to continue to do so. So yeah, you think Fauci is going to step down in the next year, just like out of nowhere, and then everybody that is going to like everybody that uh, shames conspiracy theories are going to be like, yeah, well he's old, it's time. You know what I mean? They're going to totally write that. I was going to that motherfucker. This article. I mean, I'm not going to. I didn't want to. I don't want to keep reading through this whole thing. But it, like, it even go, this. I, I highly recommend everyone go and read this whole article because it even goes into how he there was a moratorium or a pause put on gain of function research for a certain amount of time, and he still ended up sending grants to these research laboratories for gain of function research regardless that there was a pause put on it wow and he, he done so, he did so by manipulating language and uh, and also because probably because he's sending it to other countries i'm sure that helped tie it as well but um just shady shit man and it's all ties back to the money and them wanting to fund this research and I'm sure they maybe think they're doing the right thing, but obviously it didn't do us any good in this situation. And they need to seriously look into this, uh, this scenario and the media actually needs to start shining some light on this as well. Yeah. And looking into this, you know, highlighting it like this guy. I is. think, yeah, this is, this is super thorough, but I, I'm really surprised with as much narrative that's going on, as much talk that's going on right now about Fauci and the Wuhan lab. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's sticking around, and it's <clears throat> it needs to. It's bullshit. It's it's pretty wild. Like holy shit, I think it's happening. That's how I kind of feel, because it's sticking around. People are talking about it. it's on the news. It's trending on Twitter. Do you know what I'm saying? Wuhan lab, Fauci. For like the last two weeks, I keep seeing it pop up intermittently. Yeah. Stuff about the Wuhan lab, Fauci, NIADA funding, funding. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Rand Paul or whoever he is is on TV, just straight up coming out. You know the sucky thing is. Who's the first guy that called all this? Donald fucking Trump. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? He was out there saying this. It was came from a lab. It came from Wuhan. He called it the China virus, and people said he was racist. So then they wrote off the whole thing, which is brilliant. If you yeah, want to look the other but way. he was also praising fucking Z early in the in their handling of the coronavirus early in the whole thing too. So Trump was wishy washy in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, he got this right though, didn't he? That's pretty wild. And we don't, and so we don't know for one hundred percent for yeah, a I fact that it not, came from a lab, right? Because this article is not does presents no definitive proof, but it definitely lays out some compelling reasons why we should look into it, and it makes you question why we haven't found any evidence at all, zero of natural emergence of this virus. Wow stuff. I think that really puts the conversation to bed, man. That's this episode is for the people. This episode is for the people. It's for the people. The we link to this space. article is in the description. If you're ever in a COVID uh, debate with somebody, have no fear. The Illuminati Telegraph show notes are here. Just click yeah, on that article and just the show, and notes. show them. Tell them, read this article. It's 12,000 words. And they'd be like, I'm not reading that. And then you it say, is. <laughs> You're not going to read a 12,000 word really article. Is. It is super long. Yeah. But wow, man. That was really good clarification on basically the whole conspiracy because I've been all about this the past year, but I just didn't get it organized and thorough like this. Now I feel like I know why the virus looks like it was made in a lab and what an app like i feel like i can have that conversation 
I'm ready to go out in the streets and battle people over COVID. I'm ready now. I, I wouldn't recommend him battling anyone. Well, you know, debate battling, it, like just walking yeah, yeah, up and true. saying, hey, why are you wearing your mask? And they'll be like, to be safe. And I'll be like, didn't you read the article? <laughs> I get, I'll get real close without my mask and I'll just go, didn't you read the article? And it's all yeah, but this article has nothing to do about mask, but sh but sure. Oh right, you just had to find a way to work mask into this podcast yeah. <laughs> somehow. Hey, that was and good, man. I really feel like that was uh, like like a weight off of my shoulders. To what was to? I mean, not like a weight, like it's been bothering me, but it's like that was very awesome article. That was a super awesome article. Answered yeah, a lot it was of questions. A, it was, it was a deep dive into the yeah. lab hypothesis, which which I appreciated, and some of it went over my head with the yeah how the virus is constructed and everything. But I, I, I it was done well enough to to make it where I kind of understood it, and uh, I definitely feel like I'm more on the side of the lab leak hypothesis than the yeah. natural emergence. After after reading that article, yeah, I, mean, I, f I feel like it's I feel, I feel like I'm with you. Like if someone wanted to argue with me or debate me on this, now I have some actual tools that I can use in that conversation. That would be hard, pretty hard to, pretty hard to debate. Yeah, and then they say something that fear throws you off. Site. Like, yeah, the fear and cleavage. Oh, what's the fear and cleavage? The fear and what? Fear and cleavage site. Coronavirus is the only one of the viruses that has the. And then you can be pretentious and be like, oh, why am I wasting my time? And walk away. <laughs> Perfect. That's all we want this yeah. podcast to do for you, so that you can be a little pretentious. Yeah, yeah. we want to give you the tools you need to successfully be pretentious. Because nothing's worse than a pretentious person that's wrong. If they're right, you can live with it. Like, okay, well, they've earned it. They were right. Exactly. And that's what we're about here, is being super pretentious and getting away with it. Just keep this uh keep this Nicholas Wade article on standby though. So when yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Nicholas Wade. Shout out to Nicholas Wade. When also uh I have those interviews the article mentioned, those links are there as well. One's a thirty minute YouTube interview with Peter Daszak where he was praising the Institute, and then the other interview article of Trump where he said it came from the lab and then Peter Daszak shot it down. So those links will be there as well as the link to that UFO documentary I mentioned. The Pertec, the Pinturk. Sweet. I need to let, go watch that. Let I'm me in, know what I'm you think that. of it. I want to know. I'm into that. I want to know if I'm getting got because it was interesting. Like maybe you'll watch it and be like, this is obvious horse shit. But when I was watching, I was like, it seems I, I would have liked a few more sources, but I still thought it was. I'll, I'll honestly let you know because some of these fucking conspiracy documentaries that I watch, like my bullshit meter just goes off immediately. And oh, I, yeah, it's yeah. like, I can't, I can't take them seriously. Yeah. And, and like I said, with that Phil Schneider book that I read, like, I don't know, it was just the way it was written. Did you, you didn't buy it, huh? No, I've only watched that documentary that I got yeah. and it was good. No, that, I, I watched that too. That was better. Uh, but the book was like, I don't know, it was, poorly written like the you know when i see like gr grammatical errors all over the place in a book that's published i immediately get skeptical like mm, i don't know maybe that's maybe that's pretentious of me but it just immediately turns me off makes me this person is kind of a dumbass so I how much can i really tr how much can i trust them about what they're writing about right now yeah and their editor their editors didn't catch this either like what the fuck i don't know yeah, um, there is a flat earth book that has grammatical errors. And I was very upset because I wanted to be sold. I wanted this book to prove that the earth is flat. <laughs> I wanted to go, yes, this is it. And there was grammatical errors. I was like, no. This person is a dumbass. No. Uh, oh, well. Damn, ridden with, I know how you feel, man. It's fucking, ugh. Yeah, when it's ridden with them and you're like, I can, I want because you'll see one or two even in like a well-written book. But whenever they're just all over the place in the first paragraph and the first sentence and like, what the fuck am I reading? Yeah. I got 30 pages in. I'm like, this person's a moron. 
And the author of the book I'm talking about is Zen Garcia, Vaulted Dome of the Earth. It's a good book, and in all fairness, he might just have a language barrier. He might be bilingual. Maybe. And just Maybe. published it himself. But he, it's very well researched. It's very well read. It has the answers to the questions you would have. What is it to prove flat earth? Like, if you want to know why people believe it, this book does a good job. But there were some grammatical errors, and I was like, fuck. Yeah. You could never oh. bring this to college and be like, see? But anyway. Well, yeah. Good episode, man. Yes. Have fun. Even yes. though it was, hey, it was kind of short notice, we still pulled the shit off. Yeah, that's good. Super short notice, huh? So the next one, we'll actually we'll do Phil Schneider because last episode you said let's do a couple articles next week. My and bad, Phil Schneider. I, my no, bad. no, and that's what we did. We did a yeah, couple articles this we week, did that. and then exactly what you said. So, so we we pulled it off. Yeah, no, my bad. Well, I, my dumb ass, my, well, my dumb ass forgot and thought we'd do a Phil Schneider this week. So I was like struggling oh. to like get all the Phil Schneider research done for today, which I did a lot, which is good. I'm gonna be prepared for next week, um, but uh. But yeah. When when is Tiffany having the baby? Because I'm expecting there to be a gap where we don't have an episode. Uh, June sixteenth. June sixteenth. Okay, so we can get a little we lead got, time. Okay. Yeah, we'll do the Phil Schneider one, and then yeah. we'll yeah, see. Yeah, we got lead time. Okay. But uh, yeah, well, well, God forbid she goes into fucking labor, but she shouldn't. That would be, that would suck. Yeah, if it does, I mean, that's good for ratings. Yeah, if she goes into labor in the middle of the episode, you mean? Yeah, I'll cut that part. It'll go on Instagram. <laughs> Hashtag labor. Hashtag podcast. Hey, that might give us a lot of follows. Yeah. My, hey, what's your background this week? My background is the same as last week. It is, um, it's the Rocky Mountains from the view of the venue. Speaking of the venue, this is from the night of our live show. The photographer we hired took this. So this was from the parking lot. This live show is what I've been talking about. I'm going to master and shit. So it's going up. This episode is going to go up right now, Jesse, in real time. The CD is not done. But by the time this episode comes out, it'll be up. Fuck yeah. So I'm, this, is from, this is the picture from the parking lot from that show that's going up live. I might Fuck even use yeah. this for the artwork on the cover. So, Love it. Yeah, so that album's coming out. Uh, what y'all got going on? Over there. Bro, I'm just so pumped to play a live show. Again, boom, boom, room, right? June 12th, like yeah. four days before my baby's born. I'm you said so hundreds pumped. of people are going to be there, huh? I think it's going to be packed. I really See, do. They said get, that like, like every time they go, they go out to the bar, they say that, well, they talked to the staff at the green room and they said almost all their staff took off for the show. And wow. then, yeah. And every time that they all go out, they all get harassed about, when's your show? Can't murder. They're pumped for the show. So excited to see you guys. Blah, 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 blah. All that bullshit. So I expect it to be a lot of people. John has like 10 or 15 people coming from Baton Rouge. Oh, man. So that'll be cool, man. When do you think Death of Skepsis can get a show? I mean, you can get a show whenever. Um, yeah, I want to get Death of Skepsis back into a show. I don't want to miss the wave like Bitcoin. There's no wave. Now would be a good time to do a way. reunion show with Death yeah. of Skepsis. We'll have a single coming out. We can do a show. If we yeah. know our parts, we got to know the parts. I, I really want to play though. Like that's what's on my cusp. Is like I need. I want to get shows going, figure it out. Yeah, I haven't played live in a, over a year. You've played oh. live. I mean, with that, the skepsis. No, okay, yeah. I want to get actual like shows, tangible momentum going with Death of Skepsis. Gotcha. Track, yeah, tracking. Uh, you know, getting to single at the end of the year. Because you're doing seven string, and I got to get Steve-O a bass, so... You're, you're buying his bass for him? Please Dude, don't I'm buy a bass for him. Don't, don't buy him a bass. Let him, let him buy the bass. It's not going to buy the bass. It wasn't his idea. He I'm can do it on a four string. He doesn't need a five string. For you to play seven string? No, he still doesn't need a five string. For real? You could get it done with four. Yeah, but it's not that heavy. It's not as heavy as if you had a five string if everybody's low. Right? You know my seven strings tuned to G, right? <laughs> What's that mean? That's, I mean, I know what it means, but it's very low. Like a standard seven string would be an A. All I'm saying is, if you're going to be seven string, whatever you tune, the same thing on bass would be a five string. So, I mean, yeah, you could do it. No, I got you. Yeah, you're right. 
you know me, man. I want to do it right. I got you. I just I know technically you I can just, do, four, but the you know both of them low for a breakdown and that open G. That's way different than just you and then a regular bass down in D or. Does Stevo really want to do it or? Yeah. Then why wouldn't he buy his own? That's what I'm saying. I talked to you about this. I thought I explained that. No, I, I got you. Because you said seven string, and I was like, yeah, let's do it. So then our idea falls as a three twenty five hundred dollars bill on Stevo. Right? So it's not Stevo's fault. So that's the first. And, and the second thing is when his Ampeg went out, when Death of Skepsis was playing. Remember he bought like a two or three thousand mm-hmm. dollar rig? Yeah. And it just went out and the factory wouldn't fix it. Yeah. He literally just threw it away. Yeah. That's so nice. for him to have to get a five string or for us to not fully be heavy. To just, I understand. You know, dude, I'll just get him the bass. I need to buy an angle first too. <laughs> yeah, you get an angle. I, I get Steve on the bass. I played, it, I played it again last practice and oh my God. Yeah. Hearing that tone. Oh, it's ridiculous. I'm gonna I, clip. I, I want to hear it, man. I'm so. I want to. I want to. You have to be. You, you. You almost have to be there, Dylan. Like I can't it, wait to it, set that, up. It won't come through mics. on like an iPhone clip or something. You know what I mean? No, I feel you. I want to get there with multiple mics and just. And that's get, playing through my shitty cab too. Wow. Like if I had like a really nice cab. The one with the outside the layer peeling off of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Playing through that piece of shit. How is that thing and still, it still working? Sounds, it works great. It's a fucking tank. Wow. It works. It works great. It actually it sounded it sounded really good. I don't know, but um, but I imagine I would sound like maybe f- three times better if I had a super nice cab. Yeah, so. but like either way, man. Even if like Death of Skepsis can't do it, ultimately, like me and you gotta do what we were doing. You know what I mean? I yeah. moved and shit. I moved. I know. And shit. Yeah, like, I'm down with that. Even if it's like a I was just not sure about that. I, I just wasn't sure, and I'm super down with that kind of honestly. But uh, that would be pretty badass, you know. I know. I'm kind of super down with that. We could do it as a side project, you know. We can do these things. I literally like want to have the momentum right now. That's how I feel. Just like ah, I just want it now, you know. But I can't even afford to go to Louisiana. So whenever I'm like. I want it now. I'm like, oh, let me go to work for 80 hours and get a bunch of money first. I want to so, quit my job and just do do this shit full time. Yeah, I can't. Fuck. Fuck. Stuck. Oh, well. I got to find that. I got to fucking find the time, though. I just got to keep kicking myself in the ass. Like every moment of fucking free scrap time I have, I have to use it. We'll get it, I man. Need, I, think, it, I think a lot of I money is... I need to in- not be a fucking piece of shit. I need to just every moment that I have is just fucking take advantage of it. That's what I need to do. I'm going to work a lot. I need to still get it done. Yeah. Fuck. It's hard, though. It is. It's fucking hard. You got a full-time job. It's hard enough 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 to just do it with Google Yeah. But I need to do it. I need to quit being a bitch. I think you could do it in, like, 15-minute increments. You get a lot done in 15. You're fucking right. I know. Like, even if you just sit down and go, no press. Chunk it out. Yeah. No pressure. I'm just gonna do something for 15 minutes. You'll wind up doing do five minutes. Yeah. And I do that. I do that. I know and you're protecting. That's how, and that's how I get the shit done. But fuck, I know. Um. So yeah, start writing some death escape. Mess with Vulture Stone. Play those chords and just right. see where it takes you and do something. Cause that one's awesome, man. That breakdown is badass. Come on with it. Imagine releasing that one as a single. Dude, I don't want to re- I don't want to yeah, mouth out the song. Yeah, don't mouth it, bro. What you doing giving away breakdowns? It's it, man. Well, yeah, man. Um catch up next Wednesday, Phil Schneider, deep dive, crushing it, smoking his tobacco pipe. Getting a a nicotine buzz on air live. Nicotine. Wink, wink. Well, okay, man. Well, I will see you next week, show, man. Let me know how the audio levels come out on this one. If it's any better, I hope it is. I think yeah, it will. I think it will be too. I, I, I just think like my neck hurts from hunching over. Oh, you need to get a boom stand, man. I have a kick drum mic stand that I set right here. Fucking thing sucks. No, uh, I, my back is hurt. That's why I like. I want to end it. It's like my back is just in pain. Okay. Over <laughs> for fucking I think two like, hours. 
25 bucks, you can get a kick drum mic stand. That'll I have one at my parents' house somewhere. I just need to make an hour, hour drive and go get it. It's a normal just boom mic. Yeah, go get it. And this thing will attach to it, I'm sure. No problem. Change your life. Okay. See you next week. Take care of your back. All right, man. Good good episode. See yeah, you man. next week. Phil Schneider, everybody. Slam a like him. Slam a like him, brother. Slam a like Later. I will cry. I will drown. I will die.